All right, welcome back, everybody. Today's Four Together webinar is led by Liz Iberola from the Human Rights Coalition of Alachua County, and she'll be discussing the history and outcomes of the Community ID Program in Alachua County in Florida. My name is Sayon, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm also the director of the Learn, Share, and Change project that includes this webinar series. Um, in addition to the webinar series that is running until August 14th, we're also conducting a statewide survey, um, an online survey to develop long-term goals and strategies to make Florida a more, a more inclusive and immigrant-friendly space for everybody. You can check out our website for more information at weavetails.org slash forward dash together for more information. For those who are in the, in the audience right now on the Zoom call, you can find the link in the chat. Now, I would like to start by introducing our wonderful speakers that, the speaker that we have today. Liz is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Florida, specializing in historical archaeology, and she's also the director of the Immigration Concerns for the Human Rights Coalition of Alachua County. Her work for the coalition focuses on achieving tangible local actions that can benefit the families of vulnerable immigration status and their communities, including the community ID program. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can leave them in the Q&A chat and we'll have them answered at the end of the presentation. Also, if you get kicked out of the Zoom meeting for some reason, you can always use the same Zoom link to log back on. Now, it's time to dive in. Liz, are you ready to start? Yes, let's start. Yeah. Um, Sayon, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and just so everybody knows, you know, it's a pretty small group today, so don't hesitate to post your questions. Um, I'm going to talk a lot uh, specifically about our program, um, but I really think it's useful um, for people to ask questions about, you know, how it might apply to their community. Um, so don't hesitate, post your questions. Um, like Sion mentioned, um, I'm Liz Iberola. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Florida. Um, and my work done with the Human Rights Coalition of Lachua County um, is as a volunteer. Um, I have to answer my poll. Oh, I can't vote, just kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, mm, I wanted to start first with um, introducing the Human Rights Coalition. As I mentioned, I am a volunteer with this entity. All of the Human Rights Coalition of Alachua County are volunteers. Um, and I really think that's our strength. The coalition is made up of people from all over the community. Um, and we started it with that recognition that there were already many people um, interested and dedicated to um, doing work um, towards the achievement of equal human rights for all. Um, many groups already with initiatives started, um, and so that we didn't need to start something entirely new, but rather bring people together from all of these different entities um, to work on projects together. Um, so that's what the Human Rights Coalition of Latchua County is, a true coalition of people um, from across the community. Um, oops. There we go. Okay, so today um, I want to talk a little bit more about you know, who we are and particularly one of our most important partners. Um, I'll talk about the nonprofit model for uh, community ID, which is what we chose um, and which what is what I would suggest to all of you to choose. Um, and then a little bit about implementing that program. Uh, if that sounds okay to everyone, I'll go ahead and get started. So, okay. Who are we? The Human Rights Coalition of Electoral County. It's this people from all over the community, a lot of students, a lot of people involved with the university, um, but also individuals uh, who just want to be able to do something tangible, um, who don't want to just go to meetings where they're talking, um, but actually taking some sort of action. Um, one of our most important partners, right, as I said, people who are part of our coalition all belong to different groups within the community. One of our most important partners is Madres Sin Fronteras, so Mothers Without Borders. Um, Madres Sin Fronteras was founded in 2016, um, and this was a group of, you know, immigrant families, mostly women, um, who got together and said, you know, we see political change happening, right? Um, the situation for our families, you know, is already tenuous, um, but we see a lot of potential for more bad things to happen. And so we want to prepare for those changes rather than fearing them. Um, and so 
they came up with a set of initiatives. You know, they said, we need to start to have a bail fund. You know, we need to, um, you know, be raising money within our group. Uh, we need to do power of attorneys for our children. Um, and also there is an urgent need for identification within our community, right? So they, they knew that there was this need for people to have a form of ID where they could say, you know, I live here, I'm part of this community. And they turned to their allies. So MSF, Madre Sin Fronteras, is really the reason that we have this program. Um, we, we started it based on their ask to allies to have a form of local identification. Um, so they made this ask. Um, and we started, you know, a group of allies um, started considering what are the different options for a community ID program? You know, what is the path we want to go? Um, we had seen a lot of programs in Northeastern states and had allies in Massachusetts and New York um, who could point to um, government issued IDs, um, things issued by the city or the county um, that had reliable funding. Um, they could really rapidly integrate within the community. They had staff. They had an office to work out of. Um, you know, they were really robust programs from the get-go um, because they were issued by the government. Uh, but we knew that we were facing a certain reality in Alachua County. Um, namely, it's in the South. <laughs> um, and there, while Alachua County is, you know, I'd say maybe a blue bubble. Um, Florida has particular laws, um, sunshine laws, for instance, um, that meant that you know if it was a government issued ID, um, there would be this need to have you know open records. Um, also, uh, for us, it meant that you know the local government, again, a smaller government. This isn't New York City. This isn't Boston, um, would have to take on the costs of the program. And we knew that that was going to be a hard sell. While our government maybe had the interest in the program, um, they would, you know, theoretically support it and, and the values that, you know, come along with the program, they um, maybe couldn't offer the, the funding, the staff, the infrastructure. Um, so these were all of the different factors um, that we considered when choosing a type of program. Um, ultimately, we went with an independent program, a nonprofit program, because we could have control of the rollout. Um, there was no risk that you know people's information would be uh, revealed through you know requests to Sunshine Laws, um, and we felt confident that we could get the volunteers together, we could secure the funding needed, the infrastructure, um, and that community integration, you know, we could work on it. Um, it could gradually grow. So that's why we made um, that particular decision. Okay, so once we had chosen to go the nonprofit route, um, we then had to figure out, you know, what will our ID look like? Um, you know, we are running it, um, so we get to make these decisions, um, but there were a lot of factors to consider, right? Um, it was a pretty complex process and a bit daunting. Um, so we did look at a number of uh, programs, you know, run by other entities to see, you know, how do they do it? Um, can we borrow from their model, um, and ultimately we found Faith Action International House um, based in North Carolina. Um, Faith Action has a variety of programs, um, computer classes, uh, um, law enforcement community dialogues, uh, all kinds of things with the purpose of turning strangers into neighbors. You know, everyone within a community is a stranger until they become a neighbor. Um, and they had this faith action ID. Um, the faith, not necessarily referring to any kind of religious faith, but rather the idea of building faith um, between community members. And so we found that you know, their program not, was not just a model that we could borrow from, um, but one that we could actually join. They were, you know, welcoming partners. They could help us get set up, help train. Um, and so it really made a lot of sense um, for us to go um, with this model. Um, 
faith action IDs are in, I want to say it's more than 10 states now. Um, you know, the robust nature of the program already was really appealing to us um, when choosing a community ID model. Okay. Um, again, noting that, you know, in 2017 when we joined, you know, they had had their program for four years. Um, they had, you know, provided IDs to, you know, more than 12,000 people. Um, so it was really already, you know, an extensive program. We felt confident that we didn't have to do it on our own um, and that this ID had already been tried out, right? The system um, has, had already been proven. Um, however, um, one big issue that we ran into, we, we started training with um, Faith Action. We, uh, you know, brought volunteers in, built our team, um, and then the state attorney's office said, nope, nope, nope. Um, there's a big problem here. Um, you are not in compliance um, with Florida State Statute 877.18. And we said, what is that statute? <laughs> um, you know, we had been so guided by this outside model um, that we didn't consider the particular um, laws in our community. Um, you know, we had even partnered, we had, you know, talked with the sheriff's office, we had talked with the city and with the county, um, but the state attorney's office really challenged us and said, you know, you need to be in compliance um, with this law. So for us, um, it was important to, you know, adapt that model from North Carolina to Florida. Um, ultimately, what it means is that our program is actually even more rigorous than the same program functioning in North Carolina, South Carolina, Ohio, um, all over the rest of the country, because there is this particular law. And I want to go into this law in a little bit more depth um, because anyone who's on this call and is, you know, thinking about starting an ID program in Florida um, should know um, that this, uh, you know, what it, what it entails. Okay, so in Florida, if you are a non-governmental entity issuing an ID, um, in particular one that contains the applicant's age and date of birth, you have to comply with these certain rules. Um, so most importantly um, for the process is that you have to obtain and keep a copy of a certified copy of proof of age um, and a notarized affidavit where the applicant attests to their age. This you know, language is a little hard to understand. Um, and it even refers to another law um, that doesn't make any sense in this situation. You know, uh, if you can see on your screen, it says under um, 1A1, it says, you know, an authenticated or certified copy of proof of age as provided in S1003.214. S1003.214 refers to enrolling children in kindergarten not the most appropriate law uh, when it comes to governing, you know, identifications for adults. Um, so there were, there was this big challenge. Um, we had to first figure out what this law meant um, and then make sure that we were complying with these very particular requirements. Um, so for anyone looking to start an ID program as a nonprofit in Florida, this law requires essentially that you keep a copy of a proof of age, which could be something like a passport or a birth certificate, but it's a very particular list. Not included are Florida driver's licenses. Um, and then also a notarized affidavit where this person is attesting that they are a certain age and it is notarized um, you know, by a notary public. Um, also very importantly to start from the beginning of your process is you must include this requirement in all of your advertisement of the program. Um, you can't sell or issue these cards, even if you're not charging, right, this still applies. You cannot sell or issue a community ID um, without including this requirement in all of your advertising. 
Um, as far as we understand, and you can see down here at point four, you know, a person who violates, violates the provision, provisions of this section is guilty of a felony of the third degree. So as far as we understood, every flyer or online advertisement that went out without this requirement meant it was a, each one was a felony in its own. Not only every ID that was issued, but also all of that advertising that happened in advance. Um, so again, this is a very particular law, um, and it requires you to it requires your compliance all the way through the process, right? From the very beginning, when you start to plan your program, all the way through implementation. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions about that. Um, but I'm going to move on um, to implementing the program. Um, so there are three really key parts of your program. You have decided that you're going with the nonprofit model, if you've decided this. So you're running it yourself. Um, you have to, you know, get the funds, find the infrastructure, um, all of that, but also um, follow the law. Uh, in order to do that, in order to have this successful program that um, you know, has all the resources it needs and follows law, um, the first key ingredient is your team, um, the people that you're going to be working with. Um, so your team, I say, AKA your new best friends, because I really feel very strongly that um, our team here in Alachua County is amazing. It like makes my heart feel warm to work with them. Um, everyone, as I noted, is a volunteer. They are giving their time, you know, apart from their own work, apart from their families, um, you know, to, to do this program. And so um, they do it with a smile. They do it regardless of whether I feed them or not. Um, so it really, um, it is a wonderful group of people to work with. Um, and I think part of the reason that we ended up with such a wonderful team um, who are so competent um, is because of recruitment. You know, when you're starting recruitment, um, you want to be sure that you are finding people who have the same um, objectives, you know, that they are also dedicated um, to the same goals of, you know, diversity and inclusivity, um, but also folks who have um, language competencies, um, who have um, people skills. You know, an ID program uh, has its technical. I'm very it seems like we've lost Liz has lost connection at her place so oh I apologize okay I am back I'm so sorry we lost you for a while is everything okay yes I wonder how long I was gone <laughs> <laughs> um you were talking about having the volunteers on your team yes. and so, you were about to talk about the recruitment. Yes. Okay. Um, so recruitment is really important. Um, not only do you need people with particular technical skills or design skills when it comes to, you know, creating the card um, and printing them, all of that, but you really need people um, who are going to be a friendly and trustworthy face uh, for the program. The population that we, you know, started serving from the beginning um, were people of vulnerable immigration status. And so you are asking those folks um, to show you their documents. Um, you are asking them to, you know, gather together um, in this setting that could feel very vulnerable. Um, and so in order to you know, really present a strong program to have success, um, you know, for people to feel that this ID is 
worth it. Um, your team needs to be people who are outgoing, um, who have those language skills, um, and who can make people feel comfortable. Then, once you have that you know, wonderful group of people, you can train them on the particular jobs. Um, for us, training really made people feel comfortable for the first drive. Um, we had 300 IDs issued at our very first ID drive. The numbers you know, fall down after that, after the first drive. But in order to cope with that number of people, um, I guess that wouldn't happen right now, um, but in order to cope with that number of people, um, everyone needs to feel really comfortable in their role. Um, and finally, it feels important to me um, that you give your team room for growth. Um, you know, folks, some co folks come in and they say, you know, I really like this job, I want to stay in it. Um, but in order to you know, maintain your team, um, I think also allowing people to you know, step up, take on different roles, try out new positions. Um, not only does it mean that they are going to be you know, continually engaged in the program, um, it also means that they are going to understand the process even better. Um, you know, they can describe with even more detail you know, what's going to happen in the next stage. Um, and so for your team, you know, bringing in that great group, training them well, and giving them opportunities to grow and expand within the program is important. So I just want to say thank you so much to folks who have been a part of our team um, for many years now. Um, so thank you, team. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about accepting institutions. You've got your team together. Um, you have this model, um, maybe it's faith action, maybe it's a different one, but you've, you've figured out what you want to do with the program. Um, the ID, as a nonprofit, will not work. It has no effect if you do not have partners who will accept that ID. Um, and for us, we have found that having partners does not mean creating agreements that are solid and 100% on the first day and never change. For us, what that has meant is an ongoing process, an ongoing relationship with all of these different entities. And I want to point to one of our cases in particular as an example. Um, so for us, the sheriff's office has been a frustration, um, but also really a lesson in you know, how to work with partners. Um, so our sheriff in Alachua County, um, many years ago, before the start of this program, um, had worked with Madre Sin Fronteras, our big partner, um, and a lot of the families felt very comfortable with the sheriff. Um, it was very clear um, that in that moment, she was eager to have their support and to be seen as you know, someone who supports immigrants. Um, however, that situation has changed for us. Um, since the passage of SB 168, um, many of you have probably seen you know, changes in your community. Um, and what we have seen is that while our sheriff was willing to take a stand before, when there was pressure, when there was this new law which you know, might challenge her, um, she was not willing to continue um, to be that ally. Um, the sheriff's office, you know, has continued discussions with us. You know, uh, they have been, since the passage of SB 168, however, unwilling um, to really be clear about their um, acceptance of the identification. Um, at the city and the county level, we have, you know, referendums that were passed. Um, it is now, you know, the, the rule within our city and county um, that this ID should be accepted by county entities, by city entities, by the city police, um, you know, as a form of identification. Uh, but when it comes down to it, for us, that sheriff's office and continuing to push with them, you know, okay, this may will not accept this, you know, for a particular use, but can we get a guarantee of something else? You know, can we get a guarantee that, um, you know, someone who has this ID, um, it can be treated in the same way as an expired license or, or something like that, right? It's very hard um, in some cases to get 
specific agreements and promises from partners that are really important. Um, for us, you know, because our, our guiding um, force was, you know, this, this need, this urgent request from Madres Sin Fronteras, um, law enforcement were our first priority. Um, but we have also seen that, you know, this ID um, has had an effect with other accepting institutions, or has been used to great effect within other accepting institutions, the school district, the hospitals, um, and even banks where we did not have a formal relationship. Um, you know, people have begun to use it within the community. And so, you know, these new avenues are opening up, um, but we continue to have to push on certain fronts. Um, I would say that overall, you know, the lesson from our area is that, you know, there may be strong support at the beginning, um, or there may be, you know, strong pushback. It shouldn't stop a program from from starting. Um, but it is very important to be clear with those folks that you are issuing the ID to um, about how it can be used. Um, you really should not mislead people about um, the acceptance of the ID. Uh, finally, the third big piece of implementing the program are your community partners. Um, your partners really shape the future of your program um, and the directions which it can which it can take. Um, for us right now, this means an ability to reach more people through partners. Um, we have um, started a collaboration um, with you know the student pride group uh, on the UF campus, um, ensuring that students can get an ID uh, with their preferred name and one you know with a photo that reflects their identity. Um, and I think also at this moment, you know, for us, it's really important to consider the ways which our ID um, can implement anti-racist practices. Um, the community ID is not just for one population, right? Um, it can serve anyone um, who has limited access to, to government issued forms of ID. And so it's important to consider um, who you can be reaching out to. In our case, we focused pretty exclusively in the beginning on undocumented folks within, you know, the Latinx population. But recently, you know, I have been recognizing that our failure to, you know, solidify those other agreements. You know, we had spoken to folks about, about um, issuing IDs to people recently uh, released from incarceration. You know, we had talked to a few different people um, about um, how we could make the program work for those experiencing homelessness. Um, but making that happen um, is really now a new focus for us. And that is made possible through those partners. Um, the community partners also help you to target your audience with the information that they need. Not only does the ID, in our case, you know, give people this piece of plastic with some information on it, but it also connects them to resources. The, the model, the network that we're a part of, Faith Action, um, they really push this idea of a drive model, that people come together, they hear from you know, different community partners, and they get information that is useful to them on top of getting this ID. Now, in the you know, pandemic era, we have to reconsider that model, but I think it's, it's important to recognize the opportunity presented by, you know, the process of issuing an ID. Um, you have the opportunity to speak. Okay, we're still going, okay. Sorry, I thought I was maybe uh, disconnected again. You have the opportunity to reach people with a lot of information. You have the opportunity to speak to people who are seeing you as, as trustworthy. Hopefully now you've established this trust. And so you can give them, you know, legal resources, financial resources, um, and this is, a wonderful opportunity, um, a wonderful avenue to do that. And again, um, these community partners, now you know, we are reaching out to different partners to expand our program 
And that would be possible if we hadn't built these, you know, really lasting alliances. Um, the same partners who we brought in, you know, to do health fairs are now, you know, helping us to make sure um, that everyone in our community has access to food resources right now. Um, the community partners that are brought in for an ID drive can be partners, you know, for other programs down the line besides shaping the ID program itself. Okay. Um, Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. So today, you know, I introduced you to the Human Rights Coalition. Our objective, again, is really to bring people together from different parts of the community. In our community, um, there are so many different organizations, so many individuals who are interested in doing the work. Um, and so our goal was simply to bring them together to address one particular concern, one particular ask of a partner. Um, we chose the nonprofit model because we could have greater control because of specific Florida laws um, and because we found this wonderful partner um, in Faith Action, which meant that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we did have to change things from their model. Again, Florida's law is very specific, and it's important that you, you know, are implementing um, the requirements of the law from the beginning of your program you know, through to the end. Um, there, there's a lot required there by that very short law, um, but we were still able, despite that challenge, to follow through with the nonprofit model. Um, and part of the reason we could implement that is because we had such a wonderful team, um, you know, who went through training, um, who were fully prepared for the job, um, because we accepted the fact that our partnerships with institutions wouldn't necessarily be perfect from the beginning, but that we could improve over time. And because we have partners who are, you know, invested in the program, who have been with us from the beginning and, and really are giving us new avenues all the time um, for growth. Um, so I think now it is time to turn it over um, to question and answer. And I hope I can answer all of your questions. Well, thank you, Liz. First of all, thank you so much for this great presentation. It was very, I think you gave a really nice overview of the program um, and also talking about the very unique situation that Florida is placed in when it comes to community ID programs, which I think many of, many of the people in the audience would find helpful, um, especially if they're looking to do something like this in their own communities. So thank you for that. We do have um, a couple of questions we have received so far. So to the people in the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to write them out either in the Q&A section of the chat or in, in the direct chat. So one of the first questions that we had was from Mati. Um, and Mati is based in Palm Beach County. And I'm just gonna read, read out the question for you. Mm -hmm. Here in Palm Beach County, the Sheriff's Office has always been reluctant to work with the community ID programs. Um, the Sheriff is also working with ICE and holds POC a people of color based on ICE detainees. Um, what kind of strategies can we apply while engaging in a civic engagement with these entities while continuing to hold them accountable for harming our communities? Yeah, so we're in a very similar situation with our sheriff. I think um, in our case, um, the sheriff has been a little bit more resistant um, to those requirements. But as I mentioned, you know, with the passing of SB 168, um, you know, to put it lightly, our sheriff caved, right? Um, so the really great advice that we got from the beginning, from our, um, you know, network in North Carolina, um, was putting the ID in the terms that law enforcement are going to like. Um, you know, there's a difficult balance that has to be struck um, because, yes, I am absolutely of the recognition that, you know, there, there need to be, I am abolition minded. <laughs> but in the case of this program, um, the ID needs cooperation. You must continue to have conversations with law enforcement because law enforcement currently exists. And, you know, part of the primary objective in many cases of the program is to de-escalate 
to change those encounters with law enforcement until or you know at some point if law enforcement looks totally different then maybe you know we don't have to have that cooperation um, but this, you know, this advice that we got was to put it in the terms that they like, you know, to emphasize the fact that identifying someone is a tool for law enforcement, um, that being able to um, have a trusted form of identification um, that they can rely on, that they are familiar with the processes of, you know, of how it's issued um, is something very useful and that law enforcement often welcomes. Um, we have been working to try and identify, um, you know, what it is about the programs in other places that have had good law enforcement relationships, um, you know, what they have done well. Like, for instance, North Carolina has some similar laws. Um, so, you know, what is it that they are doing, you know, to really um, to make that connection with law enforcement, you know, to get on the same page. Um, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, and so at this point, you know, the approach that we're taking is through the victim advocates side of things. Um, you know, maybe we have these issues with how um, the sheriff functions, um, whether, you know, it's in the jail, whether it's, you know, um, you know, recognizing ice holds, whatever. Um, you know, we can continue to advocate on that side um, and really, you know, just meeting as frequently as possible is really, you know, kind of our current um, approach. Um, let's continually have this door open um, and, you know, conversation isn't, conversation isn't solutions, but, you know, keeping a conversation going. Um, but then also working with those people who, within the office who maybe have um, a different perspective and are able, better able to provide resources, um, namely, you know, in our case, um, the victim advocates. Um, I hope that's useful. So, I mean, more of a story for us, it's a very similar situation. Um, you know, we just have to continue to push and really try to sell those aspects of the program that seem most beneficial or that the, that law enforcement might see as most beneficial to them. Um, I think, I think it was a really good response to this question, but um, Mati, if you think you need um, some, some of the things from, yeah, or uh, greater from yeah exactly. To be elaborated um, from Liz's end, just let us know. You can send us another question in the chat. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, how did things end with the sheriff and, sheriff and what are the next steps? So right now, things with the sheriff have not ended. <laughs> um, you know, the latest with the sheriff was essentially that they said, you know, we have been hesitant just because we wanted to see that everything was working. <laughs> you know, we wanted to see it in effect. And so then we said, okay, yep, it's been working for two years. You know, here's all of this information. Um, and then I think um, more reasons were found, you know, to be hesitant. Um, you know, so the response then was, um, you know, we will accept, you know, the ID for identification, but not within law enforcement activities. And so for us now, it's a matter of understanding what that means. Um, you know, yes, while we want people to be able to, you know, access files um, or, you know, paperwork, um, to be able to, you know, visit people, um, et cetera, using the ID, um, really, the most important use is to de-escalate those law enforcement encounters. Um, so right now we're at the point where uh, we need more explanation from them. Um, we need more define, definition, at least, um, to their policies in order for us to proceed, right? We can't 
advocate for a change if we really don't even understand, you know, what their promise is at this time. Um, that's much different than, you know, our situation with GPD, because at this point, you know, with our city police, it's, it's clear um, when, you know, the ID, um, or at least more clear when the ID is accepted. And so we can say, hey, you know, we want to make sure this is happening. We want to make sure that training is happening. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone, you know, um, is familiar with this policy, um, but we're working from a place where we know what the policy is. Also, in the case of our sheriff, um, the sheriff is up for re-election. And so uh, this, I will borrow a phrase from my uh, husband, who is from Texas, this crawfishing, you know, backing up away from a commitment um, is really something that we are using to, you know, pressure the sheriff. Um, other community partners have also, you know, questioned, okay, well, what are you doing about, you know, your policies um, to help or hinder um, immigrant communities? Um, so, you know, things with the sheriff are pretty up in the air, but that also means, you know, that's, that's a point where we can put pressure on for this election um, and we'll see what happens. That um, leads me to think to, to wonder if you guys are having any, how you guys are communicating with the sheriff's office. Do you hold regular meetings? Yeah, um, so we have very direct communication um, with the sheriff um, through email, through in-person meetings. Um, definitely the pandemic has kind of uh, been an excuse not to have meetings. Um, but yeah, different forms of communication and also with different people within the office. I think it's um, really a good approach to involve people from different parts of an entity. Um, with the sheriff's office, you know, we've talked to um, the head of, you know, the victim advocate's office, the, um, oh my gosh, the chief of operations, um, the um, community liaison, um, getting different people involved, I think increases the chances that there's going to be someone in the room who sees the merit of the program. Um, so that can maybe create, you know, alternative channels of communication, um, but, you know, bringing more people into the room, in our case, I think has been useful. Okay, then um, we're going to move on to the next question. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read it out to you. Several countries, especially the countries in Latin America, can issue consular IDs to their citizens, regardless of immigration status in the U.S. How do these compare to your community ID in terms of adoption by eligible citizens as well as local acceptance? Mm -hmm. um, so part of the reason that we, or that MSF saw the need for an ID is because they recognized that issues or identifications issued by foreign governments, despite um, maybe being on the books as an accepted form of ID, were not being accepted. You know, in one case, one, um, one uh, organizer, she, you know, went to pick her son up from school for a dentist appointment, you know, 15 minutes before the school day is supposed to finish. She showed her passport and the woman said no. You know, despite the fact that the school district is supposed to accept um, a passport as a valid form of identification, this woman said no. Um, so in many ways, having the, you know, a local office and a local number um, associated with the program, you know, having outreach and, you know, community awareness of a certain type of ID um, to us increases the chances that it will be accepted. You know, a passport from a foreign country, in my mind is, you know, that's as valid as it gets. Um, but you're dealing with all of these different partners um, and all partners have individual people in them. Um, and so, you know, the community ID model really, you know, the hope is that people would be more familiar with your ID uh, and it being entirely in English, potentially, um, making, you know, them a little comfortable having that local number that they can call about the ID on the back of it, making them feel a little bit more comfortable. And also, um, not every 
consular ID, it has local address. Um, a number of them do have local address. You know, this ID always has local address. Um, and it should not be ever a replacement for that other form of ID. Um, you know, we always suggest that people put the same, if they have a passport, that they put the same information, you know, the same full name using both first names, both last names, for example, as they have on their passport. Because no one ID stands alone, you know, as the most valid. Um, having multiple forms is going to be better uh, than having a single form of ID. So consular IDs are great. Um, we've found that our IDs maybe are a little more accepted, seem a little more familiar to people, um, and also they can work in conjunction. Sorry, my mouse was not working well. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Um, then, I, it, um, then I'm curious as to the scope of acceptance of a community IED. So for instance, um, we have the election season coming up, right? So does that mean that are you guys doing anything in particular to push forward to have a community ID accepted as a form of identification for someone who wants to vote, maybe? Uh -huh. So we have not really pushed on that front yet. Um, you know, the ID, we make it clear in our presentation that the ID does not give you the right to vote if you do not already have that. Um, but it is important to recognize that there are plenty of people without, um, you know, government issued IDs who have the right to vote. <laughs> um, and so that is kind of part of this next step um, you know that we'd like to make. Um, I think I have always been personally a little hesitant um, because I don't want there to be a misunderstanding. I, I don't want um, local entities to think that we are you know trying to get people voting that are not eligible um, but you know as a as we're recognizing um, you know that there are so many more people within the community that benefit from this ID than we have already reached out to, um, you know, that's definitely a priority. So we need to do more. Yeah, I was fascinated to learn that when we, when, when we were um, developing this webinar, I mean, I initially, I guess, until very recently thought that this program would have most probably just benefited more of the undocumented immigrants than anyone else. But now that I think of it, you know, now that you mentioned, it seems like there will be a lot more different groups of people that will be able to benefit. Yes. Yeah. From the community. Yeah, ID. Absolutely. Great. Um, this is just a, maybe like more of a request than a question, but would you happen to have any images of the community ID or do you have oh. one to share with us? I'm just curious. Yeah, actually I'll show you mine. Yeah. Actually, okay, so I don't mind showing mine on the video because my address is changing, but I would <laughs> not recommend that people generally show their IDs. Um, yeah, or you could just um, just block the part where you don't want yeah. to show yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So this is what it looks like. Uh -huh. I think it would be um, better if I just um, stop the screen share. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. All right. So this is what it oh, looks like. Wow. Uh -huh. um, and then on the back, um, so part of the requirement of our network mm -hmm. um, is to have, you know, this symbol of um, faith action on the back. Mm -hmm. But then it also gives, you know, information about how we can be contacted mm -hmm. and per the requirements of the law mm -hmm. says mm -hmm. this is not a government issued form of identification. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Got it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I was just really curious. people smile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that phone number that you have on the back of the card, is it a hotline? Um, that number, actually, since that card was printed, um, has been updated. Um, but yes, so essentially folks can call into that mm -hmm. um, at pretty much any time there is someone, you know, who's, who's going to be answering. Um, they can get information about, you know, the next ID drive, mm -hmm. but also, you know, say... I need help accessing, you know, a clinic mm -hmm. or, you know, I need this 
X, Y, Z. Um, and yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in the presentation, and this is a question for myself, but, um, you mentioned the importance of building that trust with the communities, right? Um, yeah. so, and of course with the entities that will be accepting the IDs, but I guess more so with the communities. Um, so was there anything particular that you guys did in order to build the foundations of that trust or were, and, um, was there any pushback that you experienced in the process? I think the fact that we were responding to a request, um, from, you know, a community group really meant that we were on a good footing um, you know, with people to begin with. Um, but also, you know, an important practice um, for us has been holding the drives in places that are um, safe. Um, so Department of Homeland Security has a policy um, that, you know, has been breached in some cases, um, but essentially that there are certain kinds of places um, that they will not enter um, or, you know, yeah, they will not enter to take um, an immigration enforcement action. Um, that includes schools, courtrooms, um, religious institutions. Um, schools, courtrooms have been breached. Um, but uh, churches, you know, religious institutions have not. So we have always held our programs um, at churches. Um, you know, we don't have any particular... Um, we do not have a religious affiliation, um, but that policy, you know, has an effect on, on where we, you know, hold our drives. Mm -hmm. Looking forward, um, you know, some of the partners that we've put, you know, can potentially partner with, excuse me, some of the, you know, entities we can potentially partner with to serve those other community groups, um, they don't necessarily have that need, um, you know, looking at our partnership, um, you know, with UF Pride coming up, we're talking about holding it on the UF campus. A school, but, you know, maybe not considered as safe as a church. Uh, the partners that we, you know, can work with for those experiencing homelessness, actually a lot of them are running out of churches as well. So we have that, you know, protection still there in place, but um, and make, you know, your policies um, shape your policies to fit that community. Um, were you also able to hold, do it in, um, at other religious institutions, um, other than church? Um, we have only had the events at two different places, which were both Presbyterian churches. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was simply because of the space. Um, we were looking for like particularly large spaces. Um, but, there are a number of other, you know, religious groups who have supported mm -hmm. um, the ID, mm -hmm. um, and you know, in the future, hopefully, we can hold smaller events if there's smaller spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any stories that you have heard from the communities that speak to how the community having a community ID has changed their everyday lives? Something that you can share with us? Yeah. Um, so sometimes when it comes to these, you know, um, to these stories, I want to be careful because, you know, there are, uh, there are places where the ID is accepted and has really made an impact for people that we don't even have necessarily a formal relationship with that entity. Um, you know, for instance, like with banks or in, you know, situations where there are, you know, where, ICE is acting, you know, the IDs have made differences um, in, in those interactions. Um, but there's not always a guarantee of that. Um, so, I'd, you know, I'd say the most um, easily use difference for people um, has been able, has been accessing banks more easily. Um, but, you know, that all depends on their bank and their particular situation. Um, you know, a lot of people have used the ID um, with the city police um, and that, you know. Great. So I think I will get to my last question, um, which is something that I've been asking all of our speakers in this series. Um, how do you think 
your community ID program could help make Florida as a whole, as a state, more inclusive and immigrant friendly in the next 10 to 20 years? Mm -hmm. So I think that our program and more programs, you know, this model continuing to grow um, can make Florida more immigrant friendly because it focuses on local action, uh, you know, within a particular community. Um, you know, the Alachua County School District um, is, you know, focused on the people just within its community, right? So if our, D, if our ID, you know, helps a parent get into that school, that's a very local effect. Um, and so I, I think that there are all of these little things about a community, like I said, you know, with the banks or, you know, interactions with city police um, that are very specific to that community. Um, and, you know, there can be, you know, bigger changes at the state level as well. You know, th those are also needed. But when you when you look inward first, you know, at your own community, um, I think that you have the potential to, to not just make that, you know, that policy change, um, but also, um, you know, connect people with resources, you know, change people's minds, um, you know, connect people um, who are neighbors. Um, so I think community IDs really do this great job of, of creating better community um, uh, Inclusivity, integration, um, yeah, they make communities stronger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point, you know, to really be able to um, give an opportunity to the people that have been isolated and that needs to be empowered. And that's exactly what you're doing by giving them this um, chance to connect with the rest of the state and the people. So I think I just, I love that. Um, so thank you so much, Liz, for taking the time to give this great webinar today. I really enjoyed it personally. Um, and I would also like to thank our sponsors who have made this program possible, including Islamic Relief USA, Welcoming Gainesville, ACLU Florida, Radius Legal, Mubarak Law, Engage, Florida Immigrant Coalition, We Are All America, Welcoming America, CARE Florida, the Law Office of Karen Winston, Women's March Jacksonville, Human Rights Coalition of Alachia County, Southern Poverty Law Center, UF Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and Gators for Refugee Medical Relief. Thank you all very much. Um, before you leave the meeting, um, please answer the poll to share your feedback. And also consider joining us again next Friday at noon for another great webinar that will be led by a group of leading social just justice activists based in South Florida who will be talking about mm -hmm. the state of immigrant protection in South Florida. And as always, you can always um, RSVP on forwardtogetherfl.eventbrite.com. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lise, all so much. And um, this will be the end of the webinar, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.